Wild West, Cowboys, Indians, and the taming of the frontier. For lawmen and outlaw alike, this was the rifle of choice in the Old West. It was fast, powerful, and deadly accurate. Now, the Winchester on Modern Marvels. The gun has played a critical role in history, an invention which has been praised and denounced, served hero and villain alike, and carries with it moral responsibility. To understand the gun is to better understand history. No other gun looks quite like the Winchester. Generations have grown up with the image of that lever-action rifle held in the hands of such celebrated figures as Buffalo Bill Cody, Annie Oakley, and Billy the Kid. The big advantage of the early Winchesters over previous weaponry is the fact that firepower, pure and simple. They were lever action, which made possible the use of a magazine to carry extra ammunition. It just made it a practical way to store, carry, and utilize your firepower. For outlaw and lawman alike, this was the rifle of choice in the Old West. It was fast, powerful, and deadly accurate. During his days as a hunter and a rancher, Theodore Roosevelt relied on its rapid fire ability. He called it the best weapon he ever had. It is, of course, the Winchester that is familiar to anyone who has ever seen John Wayne swing his rifle up in movies like Stagecoach and True Grit. And it is the object of James Stewart's pursuit in his movie Winchester 73. Seems they knew all about your Springfield being single shot. You mean they had repeaters? Yeah. Only this time, we just find out Foxen. I count it, we got two Winchesters. But long before it was a movie prop, the Winchester repeating rifle was an indispensable tool in a dangerous and remote frontier. It was a lifesaver and a way to put meat on the table. Like the axe, the horse, and the wagon wheel, the Winchester was a necessity. The story of the Winchester begins with the opening of the American West. In the 1850s, before the repeating rifle was invented, Pioneers carried single-shot rifles, like those made by the Sharps Company. The Sharps traveled with many wagon trains, from the Mississippi to the Rio Grande. It also convinced Native Americans, like the Cheyenne and the Sioux, that bows and arrows could never stop the advance of white settlers. But while the Sharps was a great improvement over the muzzle-loading rifles and muskets that it replaced, it still only fired a single shot, and then had to be reloaded. In the 10 seconds it took to complete this task, a wounded animal could strike back or get away, and an Indian warrior could land a death blow. The Winchester changed the shape of battle in the sense that with a single shot muzzle loading or even a breech loading arm, it just took a lot longer in between shots. But as long as you had ammunition in the magazine of the Winchester, there was nothing that could beat it. The development of the repeating rifle began with New York City inventor Walter Hunt. Hunt had already invented the safety pin, the lock stitch needle, and the fountain pen. In 1848, he patented a loaded bullet, which he called the rocket ball. It's essentially just a lead ball, but when you turn it, you can see that it's got a plug in the base. That plug is covering some black powder and a very small disc of fulminate of mercury. Hunt's next step was to design a gun that fired his rockets one after another without stopping. In 1849, he was granted a patent for a repeating firearm that held the ammunition in a tube under the barrel. He called his contraption the Volitional Repeater. The heart of the Volitional Repeater was a lever-activated mechanism. When cocked, it brought the bullets from the tube up into the chamber, ready for firing. While the design of this forerunner of the Winchester was sound, it did have its shortcomings. The patent called for small, delicate parts that made the gun troublesome to build and operate. Another serious fault was the size of the lever, which was only big enough for one finger to operate it. Because Hunt lacked the funds to promote his invention, the Volitional Repeater was never mass-produced. The only known example is housed today in the Winchester Collection at the Cody Firearms Museum in Cody, Wyoming. Hunt's basic design was later improved on by a talented gunsmith named Lewis Jennings. Jennings made the gun more reliable by simplifying the repeating mechanism. The result was patented on Christmas Day, 1849, and called the Jennings Rifle. The rifle's long barrel was made of wood, and it retained the small finger-loop lever of its predecessor. 
But the Jennings was a commercial failure. It was awkward, and its ammunition was not powerful enough for big game or long-range firing. Only 1,000 were made before production was halted. No one knew it at the time, but the basic design and layout of this failure would be carried forward into one of the most successful guns the world has ever known. Though it didn't look much like the Winchester familiar in the hands of cowboys and lawmen, this was the great-grandfather of the gun that won the West. But before the name Winchester came to be associated with it, there would be more improvement and innovation. This would come from a legendary pair of gunmakers known by the names Smith and Wesson. Their contribution promised to be nothing short of volcanic. Buffalo Bill claimed he once used his Winchester rifle to put 11 bullets into the stomach of a bear that had been charging him from 30 yards away. The Winchester on Modern Marvels will return in a moment. Life was tough for those brave enough to venture into the West in the 1850s. Their search for a better life brought them face to face with hostile native people and an unforgiving wilderness. But if Americans had been content with weapons from the past, their westward migration might have stalled somewhere between Ohio and Missouri. In the 1850s, an advanced weapon was being developed. This was the repeating rifle. First, there had been the one-of-a-kind hunt repeater. Then its successor, the Jennings rifle, went into production at the Robinson Lawrence factory in Vermont. Although it failed to attract a following, it did get the attention of two gunsmiths at the factory. Those two were none other than Horace Smith and Daniel Wesson. Wesson, an experienced gunsmith, was working at the Robinson Lawrence factory in 1850 when he had begun experimenting with the failed Jennings rifle. At about the same time, Horace Smith was hired at the factory to further develop the Jennings rifle. Smith was an established arms maker and had his own shop in Norwich, Connecticut. From their work came a new patent for a repeating firearm. It was granted on February 14, 1854. Next, the two formed a partnership and called the new business Smith & Wesson. Manufacturing began at Smith's shop. To start, the company made handguns that relied on the newly designed lever action mechanism. With the Smith & Wesson design, we finally have a lever held by two fingers and in terms of the rifle by the full hand that swings forward. And this is, of course, the lever action that we associate with all Winchester lever actions from there on. Smith & Wesson's design offered the ability to load as many as 30 bullets into the magazine under the barrel. Its rapid-fire capability suggested a dramatic trade name. The new firearm was christened the Volcanic. With the addition of a shoulder stock onto the handle of this long-barreled pistol, the Volcanic looked almost like a rifle. The evolution toward the Winchester of the future had begun. Smith and Wesson claimed that their Volcanic could be loaded in less than a minute and that its ammunition was waterproof. Its proportions were said to be light, compact, and even elegant. The workmanship was advertised as perfection. By 1855, Smith and Wesson were looking for investors. This iron-framed lever-action repeater was produced by the firm as a demonstration sample. Richly engraved, they hoped it would promote business and attract venture capital. With this prototype, Smith & Wesson had once again crafted the shape of things to come. I don't think we can overestimate how much impact they had on the final design of the, the Winchester rifle because their 1854 patent and the way they manufactured the gun carries primary designs that stay with us for years and years with the Winchester. To further promote the business to investors, Smith & Wesson renamed their firm the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company. 40 local businessmen, including clockmakers, grocers, bakers, and shoemakers, bought in, hoping to get rich on the prospect of repeating rifles. One of the new backers was a successful shirt manufacturer from New Haven, Connecticut, who catered to an upscale clientele. He bought 80 shares at $25 each. His name was Oliver Winchester. When Oliver Winchester invested in the Volcanic Arms Company, he knew absolutely nothing about firearms. To him, it was a mere investment. Winchester was born in Boston in 1810. At the age of seven, young Oliver went to work on a farm. He attended school in the winter when it was too cold to work outdoors. By the age of 20, Winchester had become a skilled carpenter. 
he moved to Baltimore, Maryland, where he supervised the construction of numerous buildings and homes, as well as a church. At 24, Winchester moved to New Haven, Connecticut and opened a men's clothing store. Later that year, he began to manufacture a line of men's shirts that were cut with an improved pattern. In 1848, he patented this design and opened a factory in New Haven, Connecticut. The business was lucrative, and by 1855, the company grossed $600,000 per year. Oliver Winchester is a strange duck. Uh, he's a man who's growing up in New England. He's mainly a shirt manufacturer. He gets his money with that, but he knows enough to realize that firearms are making tremendous strides. And he gets in on the ground floor of that by investing in the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company. But the company that Oliver Winchester had invested in was heading for trouble. The Volcanics, of course, had the, the great novelty effect of, of being a repeating system. You could just crank out a lot of shots in a hurry. But the cartridge that they used, which was a hollow-based lead bullet with a very small powder charge, could not propel the, the projectile to any great distance or with any kind of hitting effect. The idea was great, but it was a commercial flop. Sales of the Volcanics were poor, and the company was falling into debt. Most of the investors pulled out, even Smith & Wesson. They wanted to concentrate on developing the revolvers that would someday make their names legendary. Winchester was left in control. By 1856, he was both president and treasurer of the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company. Although the problems with the guns and ammunition weren't going away, Winchester had the idea that a name change might help solve these issues. In 1857, the Volcanic Arms Company became the New Haven Arms Company. The factory employed a workforce of 50 machinists and gunsmiths, as well as a team of women who worked in the ammunition department. The man in the window was Oliver Winchester. In advertising, Winchester made early use of testimonials to persuade dealers to carry his firearms. An 1859 broadside boasted these first-hand reports. Gentlemen, I consider the volcanic repeating pistol to be the highest point of repeating arms. It has no equal and excels in rapidity, efficiency, and certainty of execution. Its ball is waterproof and cannot be damaged by any change of climate and is sure fire even after having been loaded for a trip around the world. In spite of small pockets of enthusiasm for Winchester's repeating arms, sales remained low. His guns were hobbled by weak ammunition, and unless that was improved, the business was doomed. As rumors of civil war circulated and the market for firearms out west expanded, Winchester raced to develop the perfect gun and cartridge. It would be powerful, dependable, and profitable. A century after the Model 94 was introduced in 1894, roughly six million of these celebrated Winchester rifles were sold across America. The Winchester on Modern Marvels will return in a moment. In 1857, Oliver Winchester had taken over a failing firearms business, hoping to turn it around. Winchester faced two challenges. He needed to develop a more powerful bullet, and he needed a gun that could reliably fire it. Winchester was a new type of entrepreneur in the firearms industry. Up to this time, prominent figures such as Eli Whitney, Elia Fitt Remington, and Sam Colt had been investors and skilled machinists who had experience with firearms as well. But Winchester entered the trade with only a background in shirt making. It was in fact from his shirt business that Oliver Winchester found the designer he needed to solve his problems and make history. In 1857, Winchester hired Benjamin Tyler Henry to be plant superintendent of the New Haven Arms Company. Henry had been master mechanic at the Winchester Shirt Manufacturing Company in the 1850s. There, he repaired and maintained the 500 foot pedal sewing machines that were in use on the production floor. Henry had apprenticed as a gunsmith when he was 16 and had worked in various New England gun shops as well as at the Springfield Armory. Under Henry, manufacturing continued on the old volcanic repeaters while he experimented with new cartridge designs and an improved repeating rifle. According to his memoirs, Henry lived in the shop sleeping just an hour or two at a time. Day and night were the same to him, and rumors of war pushed him to perfect a gun and cartridge that would be dependable and attractive to the army. When Henry developed his rifle, it was sort of the acme of firearms development at the time. 
in design and function that had no equal. Winchester realized that the future of the rifle was to make as many as possible and sell them as quickly as possible for federal use. The rifle Henry developed would mark a turning point in firearms history. Building on the foundation of the volcanic mechanism designed by Smith & Wesson, Henry designed a repeating rifle that fired larger, more powerful ammunition. It was called the Henry Repeating Rifle. Its ease of use and reliability were unparalleled. All you had to do was throw this lever, and when the lever came back, the hammer was already cocked, and the new cartridge was fresh in the breech. The magazine was right underneath the barrel, uh, fed by this uh, spring, and uh, this was the first practical lever-action firearm ever made. B. Tyler Henry patented the rifle in 1860 and granted its ownership to Winchester's New Haven Arms Company. Production began there in 1861. At the same time, the factory began making the new cartridge Henry had made for it. Henry's primary improvement to cartridge design was the development of a 44 caliber self-contained metallic cartridge. The powder is contained in a copper shell. The bullet is placed at the top of that shell. When it was fired, the bullet would move forward through the barrel. The shell casing itself would remain in the breech of the barrel and then could be extracted from it. The design of the metallic cartridges made them easier to carry. They could be stored loosely in a box without breakage or loss of a fragile cork stopper. And while earlier cartridges claimed to be waterproof, the Henry cartridges actually were. Loading was fast and efficient as well. The front-loading um, Henry magazine had a uh, slide with on, a, on a spring. You had to pull that up and then twist the barrel back. That opened the magazine for dropping in the cartridges with the butt end first. After you drop them all in, give this a twist, and you're ready to go. In April 1861, with the firing on Fort Sumter, America was plunged into its grim civil war. Just over a year later, in July of 1862, the first of Winchester's Henry rifles appeared on the market. Chief benefit of the Henry rifle during the Civil War was that it provided an enormous amount of firepower to anyone who was using it. You could discharge it 14, 15 times in the space of a minute. And when you're faced with a opposing forces more likely using single-shot musket, that meant that one cavalryman or infantryman using a Henry was the equivalent of 14 or 15 standard infantrymen. Confederate Colonel John Mosby and his rangers became infamous for their raids against advanced Union positions. When he encountered the Henry in battle, he called it that damned Yankee rifle that can be loaded on Sunday and fired all week. It was an awe-inspiring sight and sound for any soldier who was used to reloading after each shot to be fired on repeatedly by an enemy armed with such a rifle. In spite of its overwhelming advantages, the Henry was slow to be accepted by federal ordnance officers, largely because it required a non-standard ammunition. Its reliability on the battlefield was also unknown. Still, the Henry was prized by any soldier fortunate enough to own one. The federal government purchased 1,731, the state of Kentucky another 50. However, probably close to 6,000 to 7,000 actually saw service during the war. These were acquired by individuals who paid for them out of their own pocket, bought their own ammunition, and served with them in the field. An average soldier's salary during that period was $13 a month. A Henry rifle cost $50. Soldiers like these 7th Illinois volunteers spent one quarter to one half of their annual income arming themselves with Henry rifles. It was a small price for a soldier to pay in order to win a battle and return home with his life. This rare surviving Civil War Henry rifle belonged to a Western sharpshooter of the 66th Illinois Regiment. He was so proud that he had his firearm engraved at extra cost with his name and the name of his outfit. Most of the time when firearms are engraved in the Winchester line, it's because the customer ordered it for himself. However, among the exceptions, uh, Winchester himself was responsible for a Henry rifle that was given to President Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was presented with the sixth Henry rifle to come out of the Winchester factory. Its frame was plated in gold and intricately engraved and inscribed. Similar Henry repeaters were also presented to Secretary of War Stanton and Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells. This was not just an act of generosity, it was a shrewd marketing ploy. 
This was a time of war, and Winchester hoped to acquaint people in power with the benefits of his new rifles. Just as important, with presentations like these, Winchester began a sense of legend for his rifles, a legend that has endured for nearly 150 years. Since Lincoln's time, presentation Winchester rifles like this one, given to President Eisenhower in 1960, have remained an American tradition. Every elected president since Lincoln has been presented with his own inscribed Winchester rifle by the factory. In all, 13,000 of the original Henry rifles were made, and the name became so popular that for a year, the firm was called the Henry Repeating Rifle Company. Stamped on the barrel of each rifle made was B. Tyler Henry's name. But by 1866, Winchester would change the name of his company and improve his rifle once again. This time, though, he was to call them both Winchester. From 1873 to 1889, the height of frontier activity, over 540,000 model 1873s were produced. The Winchester will continue in a moment. In the 1860s, life out west promised danger on an open frontier. Hunting was a means of survival, and survival itself required self-defense against attackers at any moment. Because of this, the repeating rifle would become a familiar part of the Western landscape. By 1866, Oliver Winchester's New Haven Arms Company had produced 13,000 lever-action Henry rifles. His rifle had proven itself in battle during the Civil War and had become prized by those soldiers lucky enough to carry one. It had also begun to prove itself in the West. From Montana came reports that 40 charging Blackfoot Indians were repelled by two prospectors who were armed with the Henry rifles they had been issued as soldiers during the Civil War. In Nevada City, three bandits who had robbed a Wells Fargo stagecoach of its cash were killed by four bullets from the Marshall's Henry repeater. Four bullets, three robbers. Impressive to everyone but Oliver Winchester. He believed there was room to refine the Henry. On July 1st, 1865, Winchester opened a new factory in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and named it the Winchester Arms Company. His new order of business was to improve the Henry rifle. The Henry rifle's major shortcoming was the fact that it had an exposed magazine. The magazine had a slot cut along its lower edge, which allowed you to load the weapon. It also allowed every bit of dirt that was around it to get into it. And dirt buildup eventually would cause the rifle to fail. The Henry had two other problems. During heavy firing, the barrel got hot enough to burn the rifleman's hand. And while it was fast, its ammunition was not powerful enough for big game or long-range shooting. Those problems would be solved by Winchester's new superintendent, Nelson King. King patented the improvement in 1866. The new rifle was named the Winchester Model 1866. The improved Henry had two major features that caused it to be a major improvement over the earlier Henry. First was the addition of a wood forearm to allow you to handle the gun when it got hot. Secondly was the King's Patent Loading Gate, which allowed for firing and loading much quicker without having to move the gun. Sales of the Model 1866 were strong, and Winchester produced a total of 170,000 of his improved rifles to satisfy a growing demand from out west. The need for the Model 1866 west of the Mississippi was primarily for defense. It also could be used for hunting purposes, gathering game. But emigrants desperately wanted to have that feeling of security that a Winchester repeating rifle offered them. With a gleaming new Model 1866 in his hands, a frontiersman was confident that he could put meat on the table and hold his ground against violent attackers. Building on the success of his new rifle, Oliver Winchester entered local politics. In 1866, he was elected Lieutenant Governor of Connecticut. From then on, he was known as Governor Winchester to friends and associates. During this time, Winchester lived in grand style in a Victorian home on Prospect Street in New Haven, Connecticut, with his wife Jane and their children, Anne, Hannah, and William. Governor Winchester's rifle had become indispensable for pioneers. It had also gained a following among the Native Americans who acquired them by trade and sometimes by capture. They fondly nicknamed it the Yellow Boy. The Model 1866 Winchester was often called the Yellow Boy due to its brass frame. 
the American Indians uh, are credited with nicknaming it that uh, because of that bright yellow brass receiver and uh, the brass furniture on other parts of the gun. It just had a lot of gleaming yellow parts to it, and that appealed to them. Chief Poundmaker of the Crees tribe was known to carry his prized yellow boy on a leather sling. Other Native Americans decorated their Winchesters with metal tacks hammered into the wood in geometric patterns. It was the Winchester Model 1866 in the hands of Sioux warriors that confronted General George Custer's troops at the Battle of Little Bighorn. The General's men were armed with single-shot army rifles made at the Springfield Armory. Although accurate and deadly, they had to be loaded after each shot and sometimes became fouled under heavy use. Against the onslaught of repeating fire from those Sioux armed with Winchesters, Custer and his 220 troops were quickly annihilated. As a military loss, Custer's last stand was a tragedy. But for the Winchester, it was more fuel for a growing legend. Stagecoach King Ben Holliday chose a Winchester for his personal protection. British explorer Henry Stanley took a Winchester Model 1866 along with him on his expedition to Central Africa in search of Dr. Livingston. While in Africa, Stanley tried taking down a hippopotamus with his rifle, but his bullets bounced off the animal's thick skin. Reports like this led Oliver Winchester to introduce even more powerful arms to his line of repeating rifles. The most famous of these was unveiled in 1873. This is the model 1873 Winchester. The basic improvement on this was a beefed up cartridge, a lot more power, and it was the Winchester's first center fire round. They called it a central fire in those days because the primer was located in the center of the round rather than around the rim. The new mechanism fired cartridges that held one third more black powder. With this improvement, the Winchester 1873 was capable of bringing down large game like buffalo from 200 yards away. The rifle was now made of stronger materials which made it more reliable under hard use. The Model 1873 rifle incorporated several improvements. The first and most obvious is the change of the frame from brass to iron. A less obvious uh, improvement that's part of that iron frame are removable side panels that allow someone to work on the toggle boat mechanism without completely disassembling the gun. This was the legendary Winchester carried by nearly every character who plied their trade with a rifle in the West. Outlaw Billy the Kid's accuracy with a Model 1873 Winchester is legendary. He is posed with one in the only photograph of him known to exist. The James brothers were known to have used them. Frank James commented that he relied on a Winchester rifle and a Remington revolver because the cartridges were interchangeable. And when a man makes his living running from the law or in such a desperate situation where gunfights and uh, life or death struggles are imminent, he wants to make sure that he has firearms and ammunition that's readily available and reliable. Not surprisingly, lawmen were also quick to embrace the newest Winchesters. Texas Rangers was one of the first police organizations to wholeheartedly adopt the Winchester repeating rifle. They used Model 1866s, then replaced them with Model 1873s, and finally replaced the 1873s with Model 1895s, which they carried well into the 20th century. As future models were introduced, the Winchester also became the favorite of a New Yorker turned rancher named Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt carried a number of different types of firearms in, in his career as a hunter, as a marksman, as a, a soldier. He was very reluctant to let the world capitalize on the publicity that might be generated from the firearms that he used. He did not allow Winchester to capitalize on his name. But later, he complimented the Winchester in his memoirs. The Winchester is by all odds the best weapon I ever had, and I now use it almost exclusively. It is handy to carry, whether on foot or on horseback. It is absolutely sure, and there is no recoil to jar and disturb the aim. The Winchester is the best gun for any game to be found in the United States, and is unapproachable for the rapidity of its fire and the facility with which it is loaded. Theodore Roosevelt, 1885. Like Roosevelt, the Winchester was an American original. By the 1880s, Winchester had sold more than 100,000 lever-action rifles. Born of necessity, it grew up on the frontier and quickly became a cultural icon. Every cowboy and rancher carried it. They were preferred by hunters and sought after by sportsmen. Lady bandit Pearl Hart favored it for robbing stagecoaches in Arizona. Even children who were taught to shoot at a young age learned on a Winchester. 
But while the story of the West was nearing the end of its trail, the Winchester legend had only just begun. Life in the American West was a gritty existence at best. Comforts that were taken for granted back home were unavailable on the trail. Into this harsh environment came the Winchester Repeater. It was graceful in both line and form, a marvel of early industrial design. Historic because of its roles on the battlefield and on the frontier, it also represented factory mass production decades before Henry Ford built his first automobiles. In 1880, Oliver Winchester died of a stroke, but the legend never stood still. Long after the West was won, the Winchester factory continued to mass produce his legendary firearm. This time, history was made at the cluttered workbench of famed gunmaker John Browning. From this simple setting came concepts and mechanisms that would propel the Winchester into the 20th century. John Browning was the most brilliant and prolific inventor in the history of gun making. And his relationship with Winchester began with a single shot rifle that uh, he had developed in about 1886. Beginning with models like the 1886, the Winchester Repeating Arms Company began using the patents of John Browning. These changes in design make the lever action significantly stronger they could withstand the pressure of larger and more powerful black powder cartridges. By 1894, there's a new powder on the market. It's called smokeless powder. It develops a lot higher gas pressures. And the model 1894 was specifically developed to handle those cartridges. The 94 successor, the model 1895, was favored by enthusiasts like Theodore Roosevelt and the Texas Rangers, who were quick to upgrade their aging Winchesters with new models. The posse that went out in pursuit of Wild Bunch leaders Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid brought at least three Winchester 1895 rifles along with them. But the man who did the most to promote the image of the Winchester was William F. Cody. In a life that was part legend and part fabrication, Cody came to be the best known and most colorful spokesman for the American West. His alter ego was Buffalo Bill. As the hero of Western dime novels, he was often armed by the authors with a Winchester rifle in his fights with the Indians and outlaws. In 1883, he organized Buffalo Bill's Wild West, an outdoor extravaganza that dramatized some of the most picturesque elements of frontier life. His rifle of choice, the Winchester 1873. Part circus and part history lesson, the Wild West included a buffalo hunt with real buffaloes, an Indian attack on a stagecoach with real Indians, and at the climax, a vivid dramatization of Custer's last stand. The Winchester became the rifle that most emulated the look of the Old West. And when Buffalo Bill Cody would ride into the arena uh, shooting blanks at the herd of buffalo to simulate an old buffalo hunt, it was often with a Winchester rifle. The show proved an enormous success, touring the country for three decades and playing to enthusiastic crowds across Europe. In later years, Buffalo Bill's Wild West would star the sharpshooter Annie Oakley. Annie and her Winchester helped mold the national myth of frontier life that still endures today. But the gun that won the West wasn't really called that during its heyday on the frontier. The fact is, it took many guns to win the West. It was the large caliber Sharps rifle that destroyed America's buffalo herds and decimated the Native Americans' means of sustenance. It was the Colt Peacemaker revolver in the hands of lawmen that kept order in frontier towns. Still, it is the Winchester that remains indelibly linked to the taming of the West. The reason is simple, good marketing. It was in 1919 that the Winchester Company launched a new ad campaign. They capitalized on the popularity of the lever action. Edwin Pugsley, who was vice president of the company at the time, came up with the phrase, Winchester, the gun that won the West. It was first used in July of 1919. And much to everyone's surprise, it caught on. And by 1921, the Winchester had become identified as the gun that won the West. If Oliver Winchester were alive today, there is no doubt that the shrewd businessman and entrepreneur would be collecting the guns that bear his name. In an era characterized by junk food and junk bonds, Winchester rifles have become the blue chip among collectors of American long arms. Now bid 10,000, 11,000, still bidding 12, 13,000. 14,000 is now the bid absentee. No debts, 14,000 dollars. Increasingly, the most prized Winchesters are commanding huge sums of money as collectors scramble to own a piece of its remarkable heritage. In May of 1998, over 200 rare and historic Winchesters went up for auction in San Francisco, California. 75,000 still bidding here. 75,000 now to bid. These historic and fascinating pieces of Americana would all go to the highest bidder, 
Included was an original model 1873 that sold for $75,000. Sold for 75,000, 1602 is for $75,000. A cutaway version used to promote the inner workings of the Winchester is valued at $7,000. It is sold for $14,000. But the most valuable are the Winchester model 1873s marked with the magic words one of 1000. One of the most uh, brilliant marketing uh, programs ever developed by the Winchester Company was done during the production of the Winchester 1873. That was the one of 1,000 in which uh, barrels were tested for accuracy and those that were the best out of 1,000 were inscribed on the barrel breech. Today these are among the most sought after of all American firearms ever built. First lot number 2341 is a rare Winchester model 1873, the one of 1,000 lever action rifle. All right, 25,000 to start that. 30,000 is there. 32, 5, 35,000. 100,000 has been bid. 100,000 is now the bid up front. 100,000 now the bid go The bidding down. opened and quickly closed at $100,000. The Winchester 1 of 1,000 sold almost instantly. $100,000. While modern day collectors are willing to ante up huge sums of money to own a piece of the Winchester legend, one of the grandest traditions to honor the rifle were the guns Winchester named highly finished arms. Hunters and collectors alike prized these rifles characterized by their richly engraved scenes of wild game and frontier life. This rifle is inlaid with gold, with platinum. It's incredibly beautifully engraved. Not only that, the rifle has the most exquisite carving that you can ever imagine on a gun stock. It's a superb grade of walnut and often beautiful stockwork accompanied fine engraving and gold inlaying. So this is a masterpiece of the gunmaker's art and happens to be one of the finest Winchesters ever made. Oliver Winchester made his guns legendary. While the American West was won by many firearms, it is the Winchester that still conjures up that spirit of adventure and stirs the imagination with tales of cowboys, outlaws, frontiersmen, and the legend of the Winchester the gun that won the West. I was walking down to Main Street in Moscow. I saw a Russian policeman sleeping in the car, and I saw the side in the back seat, and I reached in, and I grabbed it. You got some <laughs> man. <laughs> You're lucky you made it back here alive. How'd you really get it? The new big season of Pawn Stars, Monday at 10, on History. How badass do I look?